right, we're back here with number three of the day on episode 13 of AWS What's Next on none other than Friday the 13th. Uh, joining us here for this session is Serbi Dongi, a senior product manager over on AWS Glue Data Brew. Serbi, did I get all that right? <laughs> you did, surprisingly. Quite a chunk of the right. Surprisingly, come on, you can't give me more credit. Surprisingly, you hear that, Nick? <laughs> you have a reputation for messing these things up. Uh, it, you know, it's, it, look, Rob, look, if I introduce every guest, I'm the one that introduces all of them incorrectly, right? So, uh, you know, <laughs> you, oh, wow. <laughs> you don't okay. miss any of the shots you don't take, all right? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Well, hey, how about this? Okay, Serbi, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, even my webcam's given up. All right. Um, <laughs> we're we're here to talk. Nick, you want to you want to keep taking the shots here? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I'm happy to miss any day of the week, right? So uh, <laughs> we're talking AWS Glue Data Brew. Um, I know people have been very outspoken most of the time, and for very positive reasons. Uh, others very intrigued by the name, but I think that the service, when you see it in action, sort of speaks for itself and uh, lends itself to its capabilities, right? So what is sort of, you know, if you had to give me the elevator pitch, what is AWS Glue Data Brew? So um, in really simple terms, it's a visual data preparation service and it helps you clean and normalize data. Um, I think uh, when you say it like this, you might think what kinds of data and why is it so important for us to have a product like this? Uh, today, data is unstructured. You have um, really, really large data sets. You have data sets and streams coming in from different sources. So it's really the ability to clean data in a data lake. Yeah, Serbi, real quick, sorry. Um, your audio is a little low, so I don't know if you're if you get closer to your mic or I'll try to scream a little less uh, yeah. so that we get the levels a little bit better. That would be super awesome. Um, Great. Yeah. I mean, those questions you were, you were sort of alluding to at the end there, uh, you know, what types of data, what type of cleaning, what does this look like day to day? Um, for a lot of folks that deal with either data pipelining, data engineering, if they have to, um, they do machine learning, they're a data analyst, all like all of those folks probably have a really good understanding of sort of what goes on here. Um, for the, those that may not be initiated, maybe we could talk to the pain points of cleaning data because there's this joke in the machine learning community that um, you know you spend like 60 to 80% of your time just assembling and cleaning the data set and the actual training is, is just a drop in the bucket in terms of the time that you spend. Uh, is there any truth to that? <laughs> Definitely, I think that um, think about data cleaning as uh, you have data coming in from four or five different systems. Each one has a different date time format. How do you bring it all together? How do you do it in a very easy manner? And how can any one of your data workers do it? Think about uh, any patterns that you want to detect or for machine learning, um, really convert all your categorical variables to numerical values so that they can get uh, fed into systems. So really we see data coming in in a variety of formats. You have CSVs, um, comma separated value files, you have Excel sheets, you have tables that are sitting in Redshift, um, big data uh, that's sitting in data lakes. How do you bring it all together and make it very, very easily accessible to data scientists and data analysts for them to now go and poke around in that last cell in the data and clean it. I think I'm. So, I think I'm putting. Hold on, one sec. I think I'm put, connecting the pieces. Right, the data exists in a bunch of like constituent parts, and we bring it together, and we make something that is pleasant for the analysts and the machine learning engineers to to consume. Data brew is that is that where it came from? Is am, am I am I figuring the the puzzle out? You, yeah, I mean that's um, that's essentially the idea behind it. Is how do you sort of enable all of this data that sits in different systems and really make it accessible for many, many more people to easily use it in a self-service manner. Yeah. These sound like some pretty hard problems, though. Uh, how exactly does data glue data brew? That's a tongue twister. How does glue data brew solve these problems? So uh, data brew is built keeping in mind sort of your persona where we don't anticipate them um, to really write any code. Um, we want to make it very easy to just handle and deal with all of this data um, in an easy manner. Um, in Data Brew, you just point to where your data is sitting. Um, so if it's in an S3 bucket or a Redshift table or an RDS table, 
uh, you would just point to it. We would bring in a sample of this data for you to visually see in a nice grid view. Um, from there, we provide about, uh, we provide over 250 different transformations um, that you can apply to this data set. Once you're sort of comfortable, you sort of play around with um, the sample, uh, you, uh, you play around with statistics on the larger data set, um, compare that you really determine how you want to feed and normalize it. When you're done, run a job on the population and you're done. I mean, it's really sort of that simple. Absolutely, and actually it's one of the things that we've kept in mind when we've built this tool. Um, one of our customers, for example, uh, loved that we were able to do a pivot for a really, really long data set. And let me put it in perspective for you, this long data set is a trillion rows. Um, and try doing that in pandas, really. So really the problems are when you try uh, doing this on big data, which is actually um, which is actually very, very prevalent right now, but also a lot of unstructured data. Imagine doing a one hot encode on million rows, right? How do you, it's a pretty, um, or a categorical mapping, it's a pretty tangled web problem. And in Data Brew, you can just tap with a click and get it done. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there are sort of, uh, there are multiple teams today that interact with data and organizations. So there are teams that are ingesting data. And these are teams that are really sort of the platform teams and organizations. Then you have more upstream users like data analysts or data scientists. And when I'm talking about data analysts or data scientists, think of different organization um, teams like, or, or business units like finance, legal, people who are calculating tax, um, people are actually discovering minerals and compounds where really they don't, they don't really need to know Python, but they, they know Python because they need to sort of do data preparation and then the rest of, um, the rest of their work in notebooks. So um, today we find in AWS, a lot of data preparation happens either offline in Excel, which means it's smaller data sets. And you'll be surprised how many Excel sheets get exchanged even today. Um, and it happens ad hoc, it happens in notebooks. Um, and, um, and most times when, when really you wanna productionize these systems, you have to go back to the data engineer, you have to go back to the ETL developer and really point them to the transformations that you need to really get data into place. So I think all in all, it's quite a production, it's quite a process. Sometimes it takes several weeks, several days, several months, uh, depending on the complexity of the data. And a lot of this time we find is um, it's just because um, you want the data analysts and the data scientists to have a tool for them to self-service. 
And then of course, today we already have tools like Glue ETL and Glue Studio for um, our data engineers and, data, um, and our ETL developers to use. So really it's, it's sort of just um, having the right tools for the right persona um, to be able to complete data preparation. You mentioned the Swiss Army knife of data science, Excel. What's wrong with passing around an Excel file called data underscore final underscore latest V8 passed around on a USB stick? <laughs> I, I've been burned there before, right? And then, you know, the, the file corrupts and then, you know, you just you can't load it all in. I mean, one thing that I have ashamedly done and I have moved past, but I know, you know, many people do for totally real and tangible reasons is like, you may just take a, a subset of your data, let's say like, you know, the top, whatever small amount of it, again, constrained by size, um, whatever amount you have faith won't crash Microsoft Excel when you perform an operation on it. You, t you do that, you see like, hey, you know, what patterns could be apparent in my data? And then you may take that transformation, like Serby said, back to your ops team and say, hey, I know all this data lives in this database. Can you perform these operations on this table uh, or on these tables? And the one thing that has happened to me before is let's say there's an aberration or like something that is incomplete in the data that wasn't apparent in sort of the subset that you had just due to sampling. Right. So like there's, there could be a category that is just not labeled properly and you may not even see that, or you get data corruption um, or you get a uh, weird formatting changes from people having multiple versions of local software copies of Excel. Right. Um, I know you said it's sort of uh, rhetorically, Rob, but it's uh, these are all real problems. And I think that, like, Serby, to pass it back to you in just a moment, like, one of the biggest blockers or, or points of friction here feels like you have folks that use tabular data and they need to work with other parts of the company or someone else with a drastically different skill set to be able to perform the transformations they want in a reliable way. And like that must cost so much in time. Wouldn't it be great if you could just have that environment that you like and then be able to have the ops and the, the, the jobs for transformation directly in line? Because that feels like it would remove a lot of the a lot of the inefficiency. So Nick, you actually touch upon a really, really good point. So one part of this whole data preparation process is really experimenting with data ad hoc, determining what transforms actually apply. Um, so let's say you have some data analysts that actually do this experimentation in data brew today and determine the 10 or 15 transformations they need. Now um, we package that into this object called the recipe. And, um, and, and of course, marry together now to the second more important sort of aspect, which is how do you automate some of these things? How do you make them reusable in organizations? How do you take what the analyst created and have that be run in an analytics pipeline or a machine learning pipeline? And so um, in DataBrew, uh, you can take uh, a recipe, you can programmatically access it, a data engineer can package it into a machine learning pipeline or um, an analytics pipeline. Uh, you could also trigger it, schedule it, uh, use step functions um, to create triggers for the recipe. And um, that's really sort of at the heart of um, at the heart of data brew is um, to generate these these savings all across the board and really sort of drive efficiencies in the process. Yeah, definitely. And, and again, I, I think we can't get away from the fact that people, People have preferences for legitimate reasons, right? You know, everyone wants to do things the right way, the compliant way. They wish they could have all of their data in one source and perform these operations, but it's simply, you know, an operational burden. It's simply, you know, like a, a, a people problem, an organizational problem where you have to talk to many different teams to get, you know, have one person have the agency to deliver the value or the, you know, the resulting data set or the report that they want. And that just starts to pile up the inefficiency, um, you know, you mentioned Glue and Glue Data Catalog, and and obviously the launch here is in Glue Data Brew. Um, you walked us a little bit through recipes. I, I want to sort of stage set here because Data Brew obviously is built atop the core Glue service. Um, how do all of these things sort of come into play? Because I've used Glue before. I know a little bit about the sources and where it can pull data from, the destinations it can put it to. Um, I think that's going to be a really core sort of conversation to have when we're talking about where folks can now experiment with this data with Data Brew. So could you just walk us a little bit through Glue Data Catalog? 
Absolutely. So um, in DataBrew, we have sort of a few different ways for you to bring in data. And of course, customers want, customers have their data sitting in a variety of places. So one of course is just data that's sitting in your local disk, right? So how do you upload a file very simply? And that's a very popular analyst use case. Um, the second is we have a direct connector to S3 and we find that a lot of customers centralize um, their data in a data lake and then make it available for access. So we have this notion of, and some customers refer to these as clean data lakes and dirty data lakes, right? And in the process have transformations. Um, and then of course, why are the data catalog? So catalog is more and more becoming um, the way that data engineering teams and platform teams centralize um, a lot of access and uh, in a governed manner to, um, to different uh, data workers in the organization. What a data catalog simply does is it connects to various data sources, tables in your organization. So it can, you can set up a connection to let's say Redshift tables or RDS tables or even other tables via JDBC drivers. Um, it crawls the data and then makes it accessible and available in a structured format for the rest of the data workers. Um, in, in, and we've also seen customers sort of use uh, Amazon AppFlow to bring in third party SaaS application data, data from Salesforce, data from Mercado, Google Analytics. There are just uh, many different ways of sort of uh, bringing in data into data group. But so that makes me wonder where, where is the intersection or what's the integration with Redshift? Yeah, so we, um, you can bring in data from Redshift uh, via the data catalog. Um, and um, the, the beautiful part about this is in DataBrew, uh, you can actually define a join operation and bring in another data set from another source in real time, see a sample of your data frame update. Um, so really the beauty is how to do this visually without having to really wrestle with where your data sits, but actually what your data contains. Now, the, the golden question for when I am sick and tired of passing my USB around with my Excel sheet, am I able to easily get that into Databrew? Because, you know, I could upload it to S3 and then, you know, I know that's probably a source for, for data catalog and, and Databrew, but, um, you know, how can we close the loop on this sort of passing around of data that a lot of folks do? I mean, not to not to um, not to sort of allude to the fact that Excel is uh, going to cease to exist, but I think people are going to continue to use Excel files for the foreseeable future. It's a really powerful tool for the use cases it works really well for. But in DataBrew, when you upload a file from your local disk, be it an Excel, be it a CSV, or any other like a, like any other file, um, we we do the heavy lifting on the behalf of the customer. So we sort of just ask you for an S3 location and then we write it to that S3 location for you to access from there on. Um, it's all part of a very simple workflow, a uh, couple of clicks and um, you have your file ready to go to you. Awesome. Now, so, yeah, Rob, uh, go ahead. Yeah, um, one thing that I've been wondering at the back of my mind as we've going through, been going through all these features is how exactly does billing work? because we're talking about pulling data from this source. We're talking about doing some really cool transformations. We're talking about empowering all sorts of different people across the organization. Um, how do we track that and what is it going to cost? Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the beauties about the way this tool is structured and um, it, it's been a very important consideration for us from the get go is um, DataBlue itself doesn't store customers' data. So data always sits in the customer's bucket. Um, I think um, we sort of bill on, uh, on a usage-based model, uh, not on a per-user model. Um, there are two sort of key things, and you'll see, this, um, you'll see this in the tool as well. One is for experimentation, which is on the UI when you're determining all the transformations. We have a session-based model for pricing. Um, and then the second is um, when you run jobs, which is a more uh, compute-based model. Um, so two dimensions, very easy and very fully managed, um, um, a fully managed sort of offering from that standpoint. 
Awesome. And, you know, I, I get this visceral reaction every time I hear someone say like, oh, it's easy. It's easy. Or like, hey, it, it's a it's a great workflow, right? You're going to love it. Uh, I I always ask people to put sort of the, their money where their mouth is, because I, look, I've seen it. I've, I've gotten a sneak peek and I know it's really great and slick. But uh, whenever it comes to describing a, like a, an improvement in experience, I think showing it is sort of the, the prime way to do that. Uh, Serbi, any chance we'll get to to see a demo of Data Brew? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. Great. I'm yeah, I'm I'm uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. You know, we've we've been promised the best of both worlds, right? So <laughs> awesome. So it looks like we're here in the uh, Glue Data Brew console, right? Right, so you can discover data brew under the analytic services, the analytic category right here um, in, in the navigation. Um, and when you land into the console, um, it's very easy to sort of get started. We have a whole bunch of sample projects for you to try out. These are just sample data sets to play around with. Um, today, uh, we're gonna go ahead and create a data set of our own. It's a, City bike, New York City bike data set. Um, these are sort of bikes that you can rent. Um, you can rent around New York City. I'm gonna look at some data then. Um, some other sort of key entities. There's a project, and this is where we'll be sort of spending our time experimenting with data, and then recipes and jobs is really to operationalize what you've done. Um, I know we had a whole bunch of questions on. Um, on on how and how you bring in your data uh, and really where data sits. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and create a project here. And um, I'll show you the thing that Nick talked about, which is how do you bring in a sample data. Um, so this is just a CSV file that's sitting on my local disk. I just specify it, I enter a destination uh, on where I wanna store it in S3. Um, give it a name and create a data set with it. Um, we also have ways to uh, browse the S3 bucket. Uh, we have ways to um, um, go through the data catalog and look at uh, look at record tables, um, IDS tables, and other um, other S3 tables. See, um, Serbi, one thing I wanted to point out was, um, you know, we talk about this being a workflow improvement tool. Uh, you know, obviously it does many, it has many features, but, you know, sometimes experience, like customer experience and, and developer experience is in the little details. On that screen, it didn't say, hey, go and travel to the S3 console, create a bucket and, and you know, put this file in it and then come back with the ARN or the, you know, the resource link. It said, hey, you want you know you want to store it in S3. You're already here. You're creating this data set. You can simply specify the destination that's pre-populated from all of the the bucket names. Like that is that is a slick integration that I think a lot of people that will use this tool consistently will definitely appreciate. Um, because you know these this may integrate with S3, but they don't have to pretend like they don't know each other, right? Um, so I'm I'm really happy to see this in sort of the the data set wizard here. Absolutely. And some of the other sort of interesting things you can do here, uh, when you input a data set, for example, uh, this, and this is particularly the case with Redshift, um, you have uh, maybe like 200 different Parquet files sitting in a folder. You can definitely select an entire folder of Parquet. You can select JSONs. Uh, you can also, let's say uh, tomorrow, once you're done sort of experimenting with the data and you kind of know that you have a monthly, um, you have a monthly city by data set that comes in, and you want to run the same recipe. You can actually just pattern it, right? It's just patterning to say, pick up everything that, pick up only my latest file, or pick up my file with the extension month dash twenty twenty. Um, and so, really nifty ways to sort of automate right from um, creating the data set. Um, you can also select it, and so. You, once you select this data set, you can actually just look at what's sitting in the data very quickly, even before you create it. Let's go back out to the data set um, and let's actually look at what this city byte data set contains. So I brought it in from an S3 
I brought it in from my local disk and then I stored it back into S3. It of course has trip duration, um, things around lat longs, where uh, this trip started, uh, what kind of IDs and just some basic attributes on who was the user type. It looks like there are subscribers and customers. Um, one of the nifty little things is uh, now that you have this entire data set, and now remember this data set can be a really large data set, uh, you can actually generate about 40 to 50 statistics around this population data. Um, you can look at how many missing cells or duplicate rows or just look at correlations, right? Like how do I sort of uh, how do I sort of really make sense of this data? This, this um, is this is like you know spent some time training some machine learning models in my day, data science competitions on Kaggle. Uh, anytime you're trying to generate insights from data, I know that's a slightly different or like a downstream uh, task from cleaning the data, but like performing that correlation plot, like, yeah, you know, you may have to, you may know the command for it, right? But like, the reality is that when you're trying to do EDA, like exploratory data analysis, right? You don't know the landscape of your data. You want to sort of get that. And and what I have found in my experience is that like most people just end up writing their own suite of scripts that they run to do EDA on the top of on top of their data right away. But they're brittle, they break, you know, they don't always show everything that they want. Maybe they don't scale out to a huge data set. And all of this is available immediately when you create the data set by uploading your data in, in Data Brew, right? So when you create yeah, when you create the data set, um you get a quick preview mm -hmm. then when you have to generate a profile this is actually a job mm -hmm. so all you do is just say i want to run a data profile job um and it's going to take your your data set and essentially give out all of these statistics both at the overall level as well as the column level so individual columns um, now have uh, different statistics cardinality the skew values um, just everything that you do uh, when you're sort of starting to analyze the data set. So look at what is my standard deviation? What are my quartiles? Oh yeah. It's, it, I mean, it is truly, I know, I know not everyone in our audience, the data analysts, but like those are the descriptive statistics that will motivate oftentimes your first few um, steps in, in sort of like your experiment for trying to, you know, answer a certain hypothesis. Right. Um, and, and just seeing that all available with, literally the click of one button there for rerun the like run profile on your data is is great and it's visualized right it's not just like okay here's like standard out of all of the of all the descriptive statistics you can easily take these graphs and 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 put them into a report or um share them with a more senior member of the team to get or a different member of the team to get feedback from right um just really just takes all of this legwork that is from a data analyst perspective kind of undifferentiated heavy lifting right like you want to understand your data you need to run these this this profiling and you want to generate graphs and this just does that so easily yeah this is uh this is definitely giving me some pretty interesting ideas um we have a question in chat from offy 10 who asks can we do this analysis via lambda or at least automated to send those graphs results, those graph results via email. I think what he's asking for, and then more, more broadly to tack onto that, how does this fit into some sort of uh, automated reporting solution? Yeah, so uh, when you run the profile, you actually, we actually store this as a JSON back into your S3 bucket. And so you can then go ahead and sort of use this in a variety of um, variety of systems, right? You could kick off, um, you could kick off another workflow based on the metrics that you found here, let's say um, your cardinality for your ID column was extremely low, right? Um, you probably wanna just flag this data set. Uh, you can also start thinking of really very interesting things like, um, let's say I have a data set that, I have a May data set and a June and a July data set. And in July, I noticed that when I ran the third run of this profile in July, um, my profile now was significantly different. I had a lot of invalid values in this data set. Again, I want to sort of mark that. So there are some very interesting um, comparisons and um, comparisons and actions that you can do using the profile. Um, more importantly, I think this profile informs you 
when you're trying to determine what transformations you want to make. Yeah. Is there any way we'd be able to see that? So let's say I look at this data set here and I say, okay, there are a lot of, you don't have to create this exact query, but like an example would be, hey, uh, a lot of my um, addresses or, or stations are on streets that have, you know, like, like end of one or two or three, or you see there, there's like 13. Let's say we want to eliminate all of those, right? Like a, like a, like a threshold filter, for example, we'd be able to create a recipe that we could then apply to data sets. Absolutely. So let's go into what that looks like. Once you have your data, data set created, all you have to do is hit on the create project for this data set button. Um, this will go ahead and um, sort of instantiate, we instantiate this data set and pull in a sample of uh, this data set into your visual sort of working window. Um, I'm going to give it a per the permissions to sort of read this data. Um, and then uh, optionally, in this case, I'm going to bring in a sample of 500 firsthand. You could, of course, switch this around, and we're going to go through how you can switch this around later on as well. Um, you go, ahead, go in and sort of go ahead and say create project. Um, what this is going to do is now bring in a sample of this data into your visual working window. Um, let me go ahead and pull up a project that I had just sort of opened here. Um, in this case, uh, what you're viewing, you're viewing your city bike data set. Uh, it's a first N sample of 500 rows. And in the sample, um, as you can see, each of these columns have now um, been associated with the relevant uh, statistics for the sample. Um, you can see we have trip duration where, of course, like we have, um, we have some sort of very popular high value trips like 782 seconds. Um, we also have the month time uh, as well as the station that Nick was talking about. Um, you can, of course, see lat longs and uh, really a whole bunch of other columns here. The easiest way I find to sort of go ahead and first review everything is in this schema view where you can just go ahead and say, okay, this ID column, I mean, this is not how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to actually, um, it's supposed to actually um, uh, be named in a different format. I can just go ahead and sort of fix all the column names, data types. And more importantly, look at missing values, look at my distributions. Like if I have, um, if I have an ID column that's negative, I can immediately see it here and then go ahead and sort of remove that. I think the, um, the amount of pain for like how small of a, but frequent of a problem it is, like one example is dealing with uh, numerical values that are encoded as strings, right? Like everyone knows, ah, yes, this is a, this is a string. It should just be a, a number. Um, but like that still creates, if you added up all the hours that people grapple with that problem every year, it would just be insane or it would just be, it would be significant. It would be very significant. And, and here you're telling me that for one of those data type um, values, I could just with a drop down switch it to, Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and you can just prime that as part of the transformation that would occur in a job. Exactly. So one of the things we did is we renamed this column. As soon as I renamed it, we had this rename get added as what we're calling a recipe. So we're sort of now going to build a series of different transformations as a recipe. So switching out back to the grid view, some examples of this, let's say for me, I'm generating uh, a report in Amazon QuickSight. And for me, I want to actually concatenate this lat long column. I'll just go ahead and say, I want to merge my lat and long, um, and then say my separators comma. Go ahead and preview these changes because I want to first see what it would look like before I actually determine this is the right one. And this looks pretty clean to me. Then I can go ahead and say apply. Um, and this, the power is really in this visual sort of view um, that you get as you experiment with data. So now this is my joint lat long column. And as I applied it, I had another recipe step uh, right here added to my power. Sorby, one quick question about the, the recipes here. Um, does this have the ability to do, uh, well, let's say I have data that has a, a field for time. 
and the time comes from a variety of different kinds of timestamps. Let's just say that most of them are in Unix epics. And what I want to convert them to is, you know, some, some format of ISO 8601. Um, do I have the ability to specify that here where I, I could say, hey, I want this format of time? Absolutely. So um, with, with Databrew, you'll see um, we have over 250 transformations and um, some of the popular ones are actually around, uh, we see this question a lot around date time formats as well, where you can actually convert, uh, let's say a date to uh, a date to like a, a now date or just extract the year, the name of the month. Um, you can also sort of convert uh, time values into Unix time and um, go ahead and sort of specify what that would look like. Um, in addition, you can also create sort of custom flag columns. And so these custom columns would then go ahead and say, I'll give you an example of a custom flag column where you can say, um, I, um, I want to sort of specify and map specific values to either true or false or yes or no, negative, positive. Um, so all of these are sort of inbuilt into the tool and there's enough flexibility for you to combine a few different transformations. Um, I'll give you another example where let's say we have a user type and this is a really interesting one because we are looking at a first 10 sample um, and let's say we even switched it around to a random sample of 2,500 rows. Um, I see that there are two values in my sample, the subscriber and the customer, but how can I be sure that this is exactly what my population has? Like what if there's another value called lifetime member, right? So I can quickly switch to the profile that we generated. I can go to my column statistics, look at my user type and say, okay, this is true. I do have subscriber and customer. So now I can effectively say, let me add a transformation that's going to one hot encode uh, both of these values for my machine learning model. So let me go ahead and sort of do a categorical mapping. Um, I can one hot encode, I can categorically map it. And I'm going to say map it to one and two. And then what this is going to do is essentially in a step convert um, all subscribers to one and all customers to two. That is awesome. Yeah, it's, um, I, I think streamlined workflow is just the best way to describe it, right? It's like you, uh, you, you preview your, like you, you have to get your data in one place. You try to like anticipate what the profiling looks like because it's hard to do effectively for large data sets. Uh, you, you perform a transformation that you think is right, but then like you have to implement your own sort of check on whether it applied the way that you think here, you could, you could definitively see if you eliminated all like variables or like categorical vari variables that didn't, um, you know, fit into your mapping, right? You can see that instantly due to the auto generated graphs on the profile. Uh, and then the job scalability is, you know, it's entirely serverless because it's underpinned by glue, uh, and supports an extremely large number of sources and destinations. So really like end to end from like, you have data somewhere and you want to get it somewhere else, or it can be in the same, like destination could be the same place. Right. And you want to perform a transformation to some like infinitely large data set. You know, obviously I won't hold you to that Serbi, but um, you know, some arbitrarily large data set. Um, this is really just a slick interface to make that as quick as and painless as possible. And basically like just get you away from all of the snafus and gotchas that even if you are proficient at doing code base first data analysis, um, you, you just have more guardrails here that protect you from really just yourself. Yeah, this is this is almost like, I almost want to make a feature request where we can have something like this for a database migration. <laughs> Ooh, well, they're, they're actually, uh, database migration service does something kind of slick like this, um, but that, Let's not monopolize it. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, this, again, and I think that's, a, it is a good point though, right? Like people, like GUIs don't have to be constrained to have technical limitations, right? Like when done and paired, when, when paired with, um, you know, like operationally mature and scalable, reliable, durable systems that underpin them, we can get the best of both worlds. We don't have to shy away from the fact that we as humans often have preferences for this thing that feels good to, to use, right? 
Um, and I think that that's a bit of a, a misnomer to think it's like you either get a good GUI and experience, but you have technical limitations, or you get the uh, thorny, hard to use, you know, technical implementation. Like, why not both, right? Like, that's, I think, relentless innovation uh, for what people really want. And you can see, I mean, I think, Nick, you brought this up earlier is um, EDAs, or exploratory data analyses. So that's another popular um, sort of action you get. And you can just click on the group transformation. And then here, for example, I chose user type. So I want to group by user type. And I want to see how many unique start station names there are. Um, and then what is the gender value, for example. Um, and I can go ahead and sort of see that there are 117 for customers versus subscribers. And I can continue building on top of this, right? So I can, I can sort of figure out what my end station columns are, what my lat longs are, bike ID, even birth years, and really sort of build that analysis. Um, once you sort of really get this one data set, I mean, it's very rare that all your data fits within one single data set. So the other common thing we see, um, we see customers doing is actually, for example, in this case, combine it with a maintenance data set. And this is really to draw out uh, correlations between, let's say, um, how long the bike ride was um, or how, um, how a customer might have switched from one bike to another and how that correlates with how quickly or how often it was maintained. You can also see when, how to optimize maintenance location with this kind of an analysis. So I basically brought in another data set. This is an Excel sheet with uh, all my uh, maintenance uh, records. And now I can, in an organization, just go ahead and see and you know, join uh, for these. And you'll be surprised how many people, like I, I would look up these definitions myself. Um, but here you can just actually preview what a less excluding join looks like versus an inner join. Um, once you've sort of brought in this, um, you've seen, so this is all my table A columns, and then I have my table B columns. You can also sort of see which ones you don't want to bring in in case, you know, there are some overlap. Uh, once you're done sort of analyzing this, go ahead and hit finish. Um, your data frame is now updated, um, and you have an inner join right here on your, on your recipe. Um, and you can see sort of each one of these columns have now been brought in. This is your maintenance location. Uh, <laughs> this is your data maintenance. Um, and then uh, in this, uh, you can sort of see, um, you can now start to sort of see some interesting analysis. You split this out. This is quite a terrible column in this way. Um, you can go ahead and sort of use some functions to convert this data into your an hour number. Um, once you're done. Uh -huh. Oh, I just a quick question. So I know that we've talked about how we wanted to make this product useful for people who don't either know how to write code or don't have the ability to learn how to write code or whatever. Um, but for <laughs> if we want to write code, uh, is there an ability to specify a Lambda function that we can run as an iterator? over each row. Let's say I've done this transformation and what I have is the result of a couple of ephemeral columns. Um, you know, maybe they are, they are the result of some of the join examples that you just showed us, maybe the result of processing a single column and then just doing a, a transformation from an enum to a number or something like that, right? Then can I then take each row and put it into a Lambda function? So you, you are able to, these transformations get packaged as a recipe. So you can imagine having just one recipe here, right? One step in the recipe. What you do is go ahead and sort of publish this recipe. Um, and once you've published it, there's a version of this recipe, one.1.publish. Now you can pick up this and, um, and, and sort of use the APIs to uh, package these into Lambda functions or even step functions or trigger them directly from the job stream. Um, so let me talk about how you sort of go ahead. Once you're done, once you've really sort of understood based on your, based on your population, based on your sample, that you've selected and you can switch around the sample. Um, how do you go ahead and actually automate some of these tasks? Because all that you saw was actually on the sample. So go ahead and um, create a job. Um, 
and in this job, we, we sort of take this associated recipe. Um, you can specify uh, where you want to store the output as well as choose from a whole bunch of output formats. So this is a common problem, right? When you have, let's say you have uh, data that's sitting in S3 in CSV format and you really like your next system after for this clean data is actually Vectris and maybe you want it in Parquet optimized format or you want to actually compress this data and then have it um, then have it stored back into S3. These are all really easy to pick out here. Um, you can also partition these files um, and specify how to partition them or encrypt them. Once you once you've selected all of these, just go ahead and um, go ahead and select a role to write data back into S3. Um, select and this is just as much configuration as you need to do, which is just specify how many nodes you'd like to you like to use for this job and go ahead and create and run this job. Um, you can also choose to schedule these jobs and now this job is going to be running um, this job is going to be running in the background. Oh, there we go. It's running. Um, once you're done, here is our here is our job that's going to be running. You can also go ahead and sort of see the details, how you configured it. Um, and more importantly, um, the lineage of what we did end to end. Um, so uh, we took data from city by example, it's sitting in S3 in CSV format. We created a data set out of it. Um, we then have a project and then this is the job that's running. We also created a recipe and this data is gonna go back out into S3. Um, not only can you see individual sort of elements of what is visible in this recipe. You can also um, see detailed audit logs in CloudTrail um, as, as part of this operation. And this lineage is available um, on all entities. So for example, in my project, um, the one that we just went through, um, you can actually look at the lineage and understand um, what joins we did in this project or what unions um, happened here and where are all my outputs going? So this is our job running. The the lineage is really cool. I um, uh, another embarrassing story. Like the number of times I've trained a machine learning model and then like I've I've modified the data set and then tried to do a retraining and then I'm like, oh man, modifying my data set didn't make my model any more accurate. And then I realized I had just trained it. I like didn't change the the set in the script or like I didn't pass in the the right name. Like you want to catch those problems as quickly as possible. And if you're talking about a modification of data, having the lineage here in what is like a really easy to interpret, uh, sort of like, uh, it's not, uh, it's not like a direct acyclic graph necessarily, but like, it's, uh, you know, it, it tells you everything you need to know about the transformations and permutations that happen to your data, where it's from. Uh, I'd imagine that these are like deep links directly to those resources. So if you were to click on any of them, that takes you straight to it. I, I know that like juggling an ARN that could appear there that's in my head is like nowhere near as salient as just clicking on it and having it take me to that resource. Because the number of times in like anything I've done on AWS where I'm like, oh yeah, this is like, yeah, this is a unique identifier. But like, I don't think that that's like the V1 or the V2. I just, it's just its ID, right? So this is this is really cool. It really helps you sort of like keep all of the context sort of like at your fingertips as you're as you're doing your data transformations. Yeah. And you'd be surprised. I mean, the the personas that you get, um, your analysts, your data scientists, um, they live in the world of uh, data versus R. They live in the world of just um, tell me what transformations like. Am I one hot encoding this, or am I splitting this column, or am I converting it to uppercase, or am I tokenizing it over, um, you know, like, um, am I managing clusters or compute? Um, and so one of the considerations we have is um, this specific service is fully managed. It's um, it's uh, it's serverless. There's uh, no compute, no clusters to manage, um, and, and really, it's it's sort of a self-service sort of tool. Yeah, Serbi, that was a, a a good recap. I mean, uh, I, I always say this. I sound like a broken record. There, with every one of these like very new uh, launches th that we show and, and bring on for these demos, there's always something else I want to see. There's always the the next thing that we could do to explore in the demo. But 
unfortunately we only have so much time and this is a packed episode but i'm really glad we got to dive deep on sort of all of the context for what glue data brew is why it's exciting how it plays with glue and the data glue data catalog uh, and most important of all, I, I think like when the value proposition is it makes your life easier because it, it feels good in the hands you use, like it, it improves your workflow here. Getting to show people that that would pretend that face these challenges for for data prep, data cleaning, um, you know, the ETL on, on on some of their data here, like they can see it and make that decision for themselves. And, and I think that this glue data brew is a really strong case for not having to give up the luxuries of a GUI, but being able to have the operational excellence and scalability of underlying AWS cloud infrastructure. Thank you for having us, Nick. Awesome. Anytime. Well, I have to be fair to our fourth demo of the day. Yes, we have four demos today. Uh, joining us next, we uh, I will let them introduce themselves when they when they come on, but uh, we will be talking about a very exciting launch in the container space, you know, cover all sorts of launches here. And this is going to be Amazon light sale, uh, containers. Uh, so, you know, we'll dive a little bit deeper on what that means in just a second. Serbi, thank you again for joining us. Stick around. We will be back with four of four on the day for our demos. So, uh, we'll be on a quick holding screen and then you'll see us in just a moment. See you soon. Everyone.